Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me as ever, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing well, and we're rejoined once again by Milton Alamadi, one of our favorite educators. Milton is adjunct professor at John Jay, uh, also the host of the African History uh, podcast and proprietor of Black Star News. Milton, thank you so much for joining us once again. Always a pleasure, guys. Thank you. And uh, I, the occasion today is these elections in South Africa. Cyril Ramaphosa uh, is sworn in for a second term as South Africa's president with help from the coalition parties. Uh, Milton, for folks not familiar with Ramaphosa um, and this coalition, who is he and what is this co- what is this coalition comprised of? Okay, first Ramaphosa. Ramaphosa, of course, uh, there have been uh, many versions of Ramaphosa. The earliest version that the world Uh, first got to know was this fiery, tireless union activist leader during the the final phases of the liberation struggle to end apartheid in South Africa, when all the different organizations, the student unions, the workers, the women's organizations, all got together and formed a united coalition He was very prominent in bringing that together. And obviously he had been a union activist for many years. So it wasn't surprising that he also ended up being one of the chief negotiators and one of Nelson Mandela's key allies leading to the demise of official apartheid in South Africa. And then of course, uh, they went on to have elections. The first legitimate elections, I call it, in 1994, and Nelson Mandela became president. Mandela served one term, and then Thabo Mbeki, who had been his key deputy, uh, became the next president. And then after Mbeki, of course, we had Jacob Zuma. I think Cyril was not happy that he did not become president after Zuma after Mbeki rather. I think he believed he was much more deserving than Jacob Zuma. And given what type of president Zuma turned out to be, um, at that time, perhaps, people would have said, yes, I think you know, he has a uh, uh, legit issue. But then again, even though Zuma was less educated, he was, a very good grassroots organizer. And he had been very effective during the liberation phase of the struggle to end apartheid. So he had solid credentials. And he comes from, of course, uh, KwaZulu. And the Zulu make up uh, one of the largest ethnic uh, people in South Africa. And they needed support from the Zulu, of course, the African National Congress. So many people understood why Zuma became president before Cyril Ramaphosa. So then Cyril becomes president. By the time he became president, he was not the same Cyril Ramaphosa of the union activist days. Some people may remember the Marikana mine massacre in South Africa when workers demanding better pay, demanding better working conditions. He was on the board of that company. And he supposedly, and there've been many reports about this, I don't think he's ever denied it, that he basically gave the okay uh, for the police to intervene violently. And the estimates of uh, the number of minors that were killed range from 34. Uh, to as many as uh, 50 something, you know? So many South Africans never forgave him for that. Uh, By that time, he was also on the board of many of these large mining corporations. He was making a lot of money. He is reputedly a billionaire, not in South African rands, but in US dollars. That's how wealthy he is. And then you may remember an incident when was it? Maybe about a year or two ago, when it was revealed 
that he had stitched four million dollars in a sofa in his farmhouse. Mm. And what was the explanation that, you know, by that time he's president, that as president, he was too busy to get to the bank to deposit the money. <laughs> you know, the most <laughs> farcical. <laughs> so, so that's the Jacob Zuma of today. It's not the Jacob Zuma who was a very key trusted ally to Nelson Mandela in the final phases of a liberation struggle. It's a Jacob Zuma who now seems to be uh, becoming super rich has become a priority to him. So therefore it's not surprising that the Jacob Zuma that we see today is the one who just entered the African National Congress, the Party of National Liberation into an alliance with into a coalition government with the party that is called the Democratic Alliance, the so, DA so, party. Sorry, sorry, Milton, just to be clear, we're talking about Ramaphosa, right? Um, yes, we're yes. talking about Cyril Ramaphosa mm -hmm. because he's the president of South Africa and the leader of the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. And the African National, why did they need to form an alliance in the first place? Because this is the first time after the election, which was on May the 29th, 2024, it's the first time that the ANC got less than 50%. So you need 50% plus to be able to elect the president because parliament actually elects the president and to form a government. So since they only got 40%, they had to get 10% plus from somewhere. The other contestants, of course, was were um, the newly formed party, MK, Mkoto Wesizwe, which also borrowed from the same name that the armed wing of the ANC used to have, Mkwanto Wesizwe. But this is a party of former President Jacob Zuma, got 15%, a significant chunk. And the other party, of course, that people that uh, follow left politics and socialist politics is the party of uh, Julius Malema, who used to be an ANC youth uh, leader in the past and broke from the party uh, many years ago. So he had 10% in the previous elections uh, five years ago, and this time they dipped slightly to 9.5%. So now, was Zuma going to form an alliance with Umkonto Wesizwe? And I think people knew that would not happen, simply because him and Zuma detest each other. So it became very personal. And Zuma said Ramaphosa, the only way, sorry. Uh, Ramaphosa and Zuma detest Ramaphosa each other. Ramaphosa and Zuma, right. right, because Zuma blames him for easing him out of the presidency before his term expired. You know, there was a lot of all these stories about corruption swirling around Zuma, and most of them probably true. But then it turns out that uh, Ramaphosa himself does not have clean hands, right? So I guess Zuma is now saying, wait, you help me push, push me out because I'm supposedly corrupt. Well, at least I didn't t stitch $4 million yeah. <laughs> in the sofa in my home. So that's why he ended up, and of course, they were not going to form an alliance with the economic freedom fighters of Julius Malema. That would have given them almost 50%. Then they could have selected any of the minor parties that had about 2% of the uh, vote. But then the, he was under a lot of pressure. He's under a lot of pressure from international finance capital, you know? Um, and he's basically followed the editorials and the articles that were coming out in the Financial Times, in The Economist, in The Wall Street Journal, that the only way that investors will be confident is would be if the African National Congress form a coalition government with the Democratic Alliance, which of course is the white-led party. And I guess to international investors, that is the only way you can have peace and stability, and as The Economist and The New York Times put it, sensible government. So that's yeah. what he selected and he ended up doing. And, and, and this is just a theme, if, if you read like financial press or things like this, uh, how it's being sort of portrayed as like, well, this is a very historic election um, in South Africa, because basically now in this coalition, we're going to get, you know, more pro-business kind of politics, yes. policies. I mean, I think people sort of get the implication of what the DA um, is and, and represents. But I mean, could you just help people understand 
um, you know, th this coalition is already going to be f quite like bizarre, um, yes. in, you know, and in, in how it functions. Because we could talk about some of the issues with like the modern day ANC, um, right. but the platform is very much in contradiction or in direct conflict with what the DA um, represents and wants to see happen. And then, you know, they're going to have to fill in ministers, um, ministerial positions, all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's, I'm not going to ask you to predict the future because that's hard, but could you just help people understand this like tension? Um, of, of what's going on with this kind of coalition. Okay, okay, very good. So I'm glad you uh, actually hit the, you know, nail right on the head. It's highly unlikely that they would end up having the same foreign minister. I would be very surprised, you know. Now, Lady Pandor, of course, you know, I love her. She was really the chief spokesperson for South Africa when South Africa filed the lawsuit uh, against Israel for the genocidal war in Gaza. She became the spokesperson. She got a lot of hate mail from domestic right wing within South Africa and from the global right wing <laughs> community. You know, racist uh, uh, death threats, you know, and she spoke about it publicly. You know, she says, I'm not going to waver. I'm doing the right thing. In fact, I suggest people, you know, go on YouTube and search Naledi Pandor, her last name is spelled P-A-N-D-O-R, speeches. And there's one speech in particular where she's lambasting the international left. Said, you know, we have surrendered, literally. That's why, you know, it took us, and I'm glad that a lot of people are now condemning this war, but why did it have to, why did people have to wait till South Africa stepped forward? Said, you know, we need to have a much more well-organized global left community. Okay, could she end up still being foreign minister in a government of the ANC and the Democratic Alliance? Uh, I very much doubt it. I hope it can happen, but you know, I doubt it. Uh, she was encouraging stronger relations with Russia, stronger relations with China. I think she was the one who was easing the ship more slightly to the left than from than Ramaphosa. So Ramaphosa, Ramaphosa alone would take the ship as far right as he can go, and I think he demonstrated that with the Maracana massacre of mine workers. Um, he's demonstrated that by his, uh, you know, just love for accumulating personal wealth, you know? So, okay, so that's foreign ministry. And then of course, the DA uh, completely rejects the notion of redistributing the land. The DA rejects the notion of nationalizing the major industries. And that is why it's also told Cyril Ramaphosa that if you bring the EFF into this coalition, you know, we're out. We're not going to sign on to that because, of course, the economic freedom fighters, that's one of their tenants, you know. In fact, they're saying take the land, redistribute the land without compensation because originally, you know, three or four centuries ago, uh, the land was stolen from our ancestors. It was never purchased. So it's not a question of buying it back. Right. And in fact, the ANC had also started talking about land redistribution, largely because it was under a lot of pressure from the EFF. Mm -hmm. Right. But now I, I think it senses that that pressure may have diminished a little bit because the EFF, rather than growing, actually lost like a half a point. And of course, part of it can be explained by the emergence of this new party. MK, you know, a good chunk of that 15% could have gone uh, to the EFF. So and then we have other ministries, uh, economic uh, planning, uh, Ministry of Trade, we have uh, Ministry of Finance. I think the DA is probably going to get one of these significant ministries. Mm. I, I mean, you know, I, I reckon that they're probably going to have to, or else they might want to collapse. Absolutely. But, yeah. Absolutely. They'll say, listen, you want our 20%? We need to have some. In fact, uh, the, D, the DA is already saying we are going to be in co-governance. 
Mm. And I mean, so this, I, I think that this is a really important thing. And I heard Sean Jacobs uh, from Africa as a country say something along this line. It's like, I think it's notable for people from in the U.S. or just abroad to like recognize too that, um, you know, you have EFF, you have ANC and you have MK, this new party. I mean, that's a, that's a majority in terms of like who people are going out and supporting. Um, but the tradition of the ANC, like the history of it, is in conflict, right? You have Zuma. I mean, so for just to help people, I mean, I think I think this really illustrates it for people who don't understand. Uh, Milton, could you tell people what MK, uh, the name, like what that history is, because I think Absolutely. that's probably the most clear example as to what's right. going on here. Right. Okonto was his way. Spear of the nation, right? Was the military wing of the African National Congress during the national liberation struggle. And of course, the ANC had pursued uh, nonviolence as its policy until after the uh, Sharpeville uh, massacre. Um, and then after, you know, after, you know, early in the 1960s, they concluded that, listen, the state is responding with brutality. Uh, we have really no choice. And the ANC adopted uh, there was a lot of debate, there was a lot of division, but at the end, um, Nelson Mandela and others prevailed. And they took um, armed resistance, became part of the struggle, and Omkonto Wesizwe was formed. If people go back and look at uh, the Rivonia trial, the treason trial, on which Mandela and his uh, comrades, many comrades were convicted, ended up serving 27 years. There's speeches, uh, there's a speech that he made in his own defense. The quality, the audio is not that great, but I highly recommend it. If you listen carefully, he makes a, the, most, the most learned justification for armed struggle, <laughs> right? You know, he gave the statistics of the number of people who are dying of malnutrition, of poor health care, of the in economic inequities, and he said, um, and the indignities of grown men being referred to as boys by young uh, white South Africans, um, you know, we're stripped of our humanity. At the end of the day, what would you do? And then even after we made the uh, uh, decision to take on struggle, we did not do it lightly. He said, I discovered, I read all the books by people that had written about armed conflict, whether they were writers from the West whether they were from the East. And then I took what I believe were the best lessons. And one of the decisions we also made was not to go after civilians. We're only going to target government installations and, and buildings. So yes, when Contra West Israel became a, a, a very um, a big factor because now it allowed all the other African countries to support them by providing training, providing weapons, providing finances. It allowed the Soviet Union, China, uh, Cuba, and then later on, um, uh, Libya, uh, to provide them with resources. So Umkonto West Israel has a very uh, revered status uh, in the, the liberation struggle in South Africa. So he selected that name, of course, deliberately, in a way saying, listen, basically, the version of the ANC that is led by Jack, uh, by uh, Cyril Ramaphosa right now is a sellout, is taking us backward. In fact, it's willing to form, and it did form, an alliance of uh, what he would ca uh, uh, categorize as the party of apartheid. So that's why he called his party, uh, he usurped that name, uh, MK, on Quanta West Israel. But, and, but, do, do but, but again, I know you talked about Zuma, so we don't have to get like super into it. But just to be very clear here, um, even though Zuma is sort of running this campaign and running this party, like talking about the spirit of the ANC, politically, it's not necessarily like the most radical formation. Um, you know, like Zuma doesn't sort of represent, um, you know, as much of a return as he might like to be portraying to the to the country. Absolutely not. It's it's uh, definitely uh, opportunistic. But at the same time, it's in fact, uh, one could say it's actually kind of helpful to Ramaphosa in a way, because uh, Zuma is, is saying that in terms of the land redistribution, he wants the people that are critical in making the decisions to be 
traditional uh, so-called chiefs, traditional rulers in the rural areas. So um, it's 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 rather it's going back a little bit. People would say to a sort of like um, ethnic-based politics. He's taking advantage of the fact that he comes from uh, KwaZulu and they have a large population. Uh, so he's looking more at regional interest and politics rather than forward-looking national politics. That land, the demand for land is, is tremendous. I mean, uh, look, uh, the African population, which is 80%, control only 4% of, of the arable available land, uh, agricultural land. So this is not really a KwaZulu issue. This is a national issue that affects uh, people in all parts of the country. Uh, so uh, he's not as progressive as the economic freedom fighters. So in a way, he is also going to be an obstacle to the kind of party that uh, the economic freedom fighter was evolving toward. So in that respect, he's actually more helpful to, uh, uh, at least right now, to Ramaphosa than to, uh, than to EFF and Julius Malema. But I think that could change. Uh, Malema is working aggressively, not only to try to get people from the ANC to come toward him by saying, wait a minute, did you guys really sign up? Did you ever envision that you could end up being an alliance? with the DA, right? And I'm sure there's a good number who would be willing to listen to that. And I'm sure he's not, um, uh, I'm sure he's going to be aggressive in pursuing that approach. And then I think he also believes that, I mean, after all, Zuma is already, I think he's 80 years old. So I think he believes he can bid his time and actually get into an alliance with, uh, with uh, the people who are now in MK primarily because Zuma is still the symbol of MK. So I think if he's saying in five, within now, between now and the next five, five years before the next elections, I can actually get a good chunk of MK on my side and substantial numbers of people who are still with Cyril Ramaphosa to my side, I think that to me makes sense. And that could actually happen. I think, um, I think Ramaphosa is going to be under tremendous pressure. I wonder how long this coalition can really last. I mean, if you look at the issue of unemployment alone, right, where you have an employment of uh, Black South Africans ranging from 37% to 40%, when, on the other hand, you have unemployment of European uh, White South Africans ranging from 5.9% to 7.4%, it fluctuates within this margin. That to me is untenable. Now they've been able to divert, you know, they're doing a lot of the things that you see that, you know, the right does in this country as well. They've brought up the whole conversation about, oh, we need to build a wall. And that people are actually talking about building a wall in South Africa now to keep uh, migrant workers from other African countries out of the country as if they are the primary cause of the high rates of unemployment. You know, of course it's preposterous, but it's very emotive. And that actually does work. I went to, uh, to Julius Malema's page, his, uh, his Twitter, X page after the election. And you could see a lot of the postings where people who said, you know, listen, you know, you're good, but you can't, you know, South Africa must come first. You can't be speaking about other Africans before you address our needs. So those were the kind of tweets that he was getting in response to his tweet, which was, you know, thank you for voting for us. You know, we work harder in the next couple of years, you know, and so on and so forth. So that has become an issue of diversion, a very effective issue in South Africa. I mean, not to be too frank, but I mean, the, maybe the immigration control should have been against the uh, colonial uh, invaders <laughs> a, a, a while ago. I mean, the, 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 the kind of like 
we hear about the EFF and the layman in the context of, I think, rather hysterical, white hysterical um, sort of reaction to their chants and things like that. But I think what's really, like you say, um, scaring people is that demand, which is land redistribution without compensation. Yes. And Absolutely. that is a promise made, in my understanding, by the uh, end of apartheid that we're going to eventually get yes. around to this. And it just hasn't happened. And I mean, that's what I was kind of confused about right. is why the EFF seems sort of perfect situated to be the the sort of spokesperson for that right. demand and yet you right. got the mk emerging uh, right evidence. okay all right so i'm glad you said that i think there are also a number of uh, a number of issues um the impact of corporate media in demonizing the eff and also playing on you know, Malema's persona, right? Uh, he tends to be, as you know, you know, he doesn't mince words, right? He's very fiery. And so they paint him as this person who's uh, capable of transforming himself into a dictator and turning us into, you know, just like the rest of the other African countries. So the uh, there's enough material out there for them to create this uh, very effective propaganda of demonization. And one of the things that uh, the DA, if you read some of the interviews that the, uh, the Democratic Alliance was giving to a lot of the international media, was that the EFF is going to turn South Africa into Zimbabwe or Venezuela. You know, so that became <laughs> Uh, a very effective uh, uh, propaganda as well. But at the end of the day, it's really, I mean, a sad testament, and this is not the first time, you know, it's happened, of course. So in Kenya, for example, Kenya was one of the other African countries where you had a large European settler population, right? And I use the word settler very hesitantly because it's hard for me to refer to Somebody, the settler that comes there, commits ethnic cleansing, and then takes over your land, and then turns you into her or his employee on the land that used to belong to you, right? <laughs> so they did that in Kenya. About a thousand European families uh, took over more than two million uh, acres of the most prime land. They call it, you know, the Kenyan, uh, the White Highlands is what it was called. And of course, it, in, it, it sparked uh, one of the earliest armed resistance struggles against colonialism in Africa, which was the Kenya Land and Freedom Army that the British demonized as Mau Mau because it, you know, it evokes, you know, peril and dread, you know. And um, then, of course, it ended when the leader, and it ended because the British mobilized imperial forces. So. It brought uh, British troops from England, from its colonies like uh, Uganda and other British colonies um, uh, from, from India. So it was really a concerted effort and they managed to really uh, destroy this. And then what emerged? After they killed Dedan Kimati, who was the leader of the armed resistance, then the most prominent person after him was Jomo Kenyatta, right? And Jomo Kenyatta, ironically, had been locked unfairly, of course, uh, uh, for seven years by the British as the supposed leader of the, uh, the, the resistance, when in fact he was not, right? And he proved that. After he was released, he shook hands with the British. He ended up being one of the largest uh, landowners, his family, in Kenya today. And that was the end of... Uh, uh, left politics in Kenya. Kenya became the one of the major headquarters of corporate, uh, the Western corporate uh, uh, companies. Most of them have their offices or headquarters in Kenya today. It, it was only a few years ago that they built a statue to recognize Dedan Kimati, who led the armed resistance. That paved the way and gave the presidency to Joma Kenyatta on a silver plaque. Platter. So uh, they seem to be uh, already have done the same 
in South Africa. So, because in Kenya you had Odinga Oginga, who is the father of Raila Oginga, who's a prominent opposition leader in Kenya today, and he was socialist, and he was also demonized. Was reading, uh, forget the title, the memoirs of the first U.S. ambassador uh, to Kenya, and he was writing about, you know, uh, Oginga, who was a socialist, as if he's, you know, this devil and not even a human being. And he was, he was actually praising his role in creating a wedge between uh, Odinga and Jomo Kenyatta and sort of bringing Kenyatta to our camp, you know, the Western camp. So that's what happened in Kenya. As a result, even up today, the land issue has not been resolved in Kenya. It's not widely spoken about, but, you know, Kenya has the same problem. So South Africa seems like they're using the same template. Let's you know, make uh, Cyril Ramaphosa our version of Jomo Kenyatta. And let's make sure we sideline uh, uh, Julius Malema, just like we sideline uh, Oginga Odinga. I think nowadays you have much more tools to mobilize uh, the youth uh, population. I, I, I don't think it's going to be easier this time around than it was in the 1960s when you dominated uh, media just by being uh, because there are only a handful of powerful media back in those days. You know, you have the New York Times, you have the BBC, uh, you have Voice of America. I don't know who the other big players were, but that's it, just a handful. So, you know, able to shut people out of, uh, of uh, communication space. I think it's much tougher today. So I think they have not heard the last of Julius Malema and the and economic freedom fighters in South Africa. Well, I mean, I, I did want to ask you a little bit about that um, before we move on, just uh, because Malema has been uh, president of uh, of EFF for over a decade now. Um, yes. And I was just curious um, if you have any sense of, of whether or not there's kind of like internal pressure on him to maybe, you know, nominate a successor or, or someone else to sort of take the helm because Malema is um, rightly or wrongly, I think, you know, <laughs> as, you know, as a character. Um, He's and, a character. You know. <laughs> He's, uh, okay, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If there was a, a Steve Biko today, right? A version of a Steve Biko who's in his 30s or in his 40s, we would not be talking about an alliance of the African National Congress and the Democratic Alliance. No way, impossible. If we had a Robert Sobukwe caliber leader today, and Robert Sobukwe was, of course, the one who founded the Pan-Africanist Congress, he broke from the ANC because they th he thought the ANC was becoming uh, like too broad of an umbrella. I said, fine, I don't mind, we can have a multinational, multi-racial organization, but he wanted the leadership to be primarily uh, Black African. You see, we need to learn how to uh, demand for our causes. Uh, so that's why he, that was very important for him, and he broke. And he's the one that organized the, uh, the march on the police stations that led to the Sharpeville massacre. And all he wanted to do was people to go with their, the detested passport which is the internal passport that every uh, black person had to carry uh, before the end of apartheid. And he wanted people to go in front of the police station, burn it, and then surrender, and overwhelm the police stations by inviting them to arrest tens of thousands of people, right? But instead, you know, uh, they scatter them with bullets. So what I'm suggesting is that I'm agreeing with you that, uh, uh, there's, uh, we don't have the caliber type of leadership that we had in the 1960s. And part of that is not only limited to South Africa, by the way, you know, I mean, it's very throughout fair. the African continent. <laughs> yeah, really. globally too, frankly. Glo yeah. Okay, thank you. You know, back in those days, these guys had access to read uh, left politics, to read politics, to read about economics that challenge, you know, what was being propagated by uh, primarily by the British initially, and then by their partner in neocolonialism, which is the United States after the 1960s. In fact, after World War II, 
you know, when Britain essentially needed to be bailed out by the United States, you know, politically, of course, uh, militarily, and then financially. So the U.S. became like sort of a global partner, at least in terms of enforcing uh, neo-colonialism in Africa. So the, the literature that challenged what is now known as neoliberalism became very scarce. Um, people that taught uh, would not, you know, get jobs in African universities, you know. So the kind of institutions that are now funded and financed in African universities are the ones that, you know, preach the mantra of capital, right? So that also played a role. And so it's ironic that actually during apartheid, <laughs> you could produce African leaders who are much more conscious that the world does not spin only around capital and capitalism. You know, you know? It's, it's something that uh, I'm going to kind of paraphrase it and not hit it as well, but it's something that uh, Franz Fanon wrote that I always found was like really astute was that, you know, under colonization, right, it's easier to sort of see um, your yes. oppressor, right? Yes. Because it's, it's, there's a flag <laughs> that's not yours over the building. Right. And, you know, yeah. And, and uh, you know, under these other systems, it's harder. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird kind of dialectic, you know, tension or, or whatnot. But I think it's right. absolutely true. Right. And something else you said, and this was, you know, saying if Africa, if Africans that emerged after the end of formal colonialism, if you don't have a different vision, if you want to replicate Europe, and build Europe, why don't you let the Europeans do it for you then? They're much more qualified than the most qualified of us, of any one of us in doing that. So he also says that, and I'm also paraphrasing as well, you know? Yeah, well, Milton, um, before we let you go, I, I want to uh, ask you about Manufacturing Hate, which is a, a, your, your great book. And uh, thank you. You got to you got to go fund me about this here. I'll put up uh, explain to people the circumstance of this go fund me. OK, very good. So when the book first came out, first of all, it took me a long time to get a publisher. Right. When I first I, when I saw published it as uh, the hearts of darkness, how white writers create the racist image in Africa. You know, it was selling well, but it's impossible, to, you know, maybe you should probably know, it's very challenging to get anybody to review a self-published book, right? So I went through the process, kept looking for publishers, so I get a publisher, they do the editing, I make changes, we agree on this new title and all that, they like it. Finally, I have a publisher, finally I can review. And it's not like I got a gazillion reviews. I got three or four reviews, including Kirkus Review. But it was selling well when it first came out two years ago. I was getting, you know, decent royalty checks very frequently, ranging from $500 to $700. And people are telling me, hey, man, I've had a book for years. I'm not getting a, any checks. So, you know, consider that actually decent. And then people started telling me that they would order the book and wait for a long time and never get it. And of course, that's a problem. And I was complaining to the publisher, right? And then last year, one of my students says, uh, and this is the first time I find out my book is not being printed, the physical version, even though the contract calls for the physical as well as electronic. So my student says, I want a physical copy. I can't get it. I said, no, go online. There are two options. There's electronic and there's the physical version. Just click on that. So no, professor, it's not there. I was like, okay, here, bring your computer. I'm like, what's wrong with this student, right? Because <laughs> I'd ordered it many times for other people that way. So my student brings a computer, lay it out, and I tell my class, oh, open your computer so I can tell you how to order it. And that is the first time that I find out that my publisher had stopped printing it without even letting me know. Through What's my student, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, wait a minute, why aren't you printing a book that was actually doing well? So now I don't want to engage in conspiracy theories. Yeah, right. I just know for some reason, publisher does not want to make a book widely available, even though people want to buy the book. So I said, okay, I, I would like to get my copyright back. And they said, well, blah, 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 you know, we can't give it to you at, you know, just like that, you're gonna to have to buy it back. So I said, okay, um, since you're not printing it, it means it's not doing well. So 
I'm willing to offer $500. And they came back and said, no, the minimum would be $3,000. You know, so it's something that they technically don't want because they're not printing it, but they're not willing to give it back for free to me, right? <laughs> I mean, I know the book will do well once I get another publisher. And if need be, I may just, you know, decide to self-publish it once again. Uh, because it's already been published by a publisher. I would not make any changes, you know. And so that's why I want to, I, I put up this GoFundMe and so far I've raised $1,000. And once I get, you know, the balance, I'll buy the copyright back. Hopefully I'll make the book available before the end of the year again. I, I mean, I remember reading that, um, as a media studies, uh, you know, student uh, graduate from NYU, I mean, it's something that should be on any syllabus of people, uh, you know, paying attention to, you know, world history and how it gets translated into media. So, yeah, I mean, Thank you. you should definitely liberate it from a publisher who's not doing it the uh, justice yeah. it deserves. Yeah. And, you know, I put some pressure on the Times, too. I know they don't like me at the Times, uh, even though I felt actually I did them a, a service because what I did, you did. was I discovered a lot of these racist correspondence between reporters they sent to Africa and editors here in New York that they probably didn't even know they had, you know, because yeah. by the time I'm doing the research, all those guys were gone from the scene. In fact, I wrote to them. I said, listen, we're, 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 we're where we are today, right? This is your past. I'm actually willing to be a part of you improving your coverage going forward. We can start off by me writing an op-ed saying, this is what the research discovered. This is where you are today. This is where you might need to go. Uh, that opportunity I offered was rejected. <laughs> Never <laughs> responded to. A friend yeah. of mine who actually writes book reviews for the Times gave me the name of an editor. He said, I know this editor would review the book. You know, I was like, okay. So I sent a copy not even an acknowledgement. And here's the final thing I did, which was actually, I thought was, you know, they should have actually responded to that. The Times wrote a very long editorial story. Uh, I think it was no, actually it was an article, a very long article. When the Kansas City Star apologized for its historical demonization of black Kansans and said, you know, this is where we are today. This is where we want to go. And I said, I wrote to the you know, Times. I said, you know, since you've done an, done an article on the Kansas City Star, don't you think you should acknowledge your history as well with respect to Africa and actually write a similar apology, just like the Kansas City Star? No response to that either. But hey, yeah. you know, I have to say, um, you know, things like that actually don't, does not discourage me at all. It makes you actually work even harder to, to get the message out, right? It took me like uh, almost 20 years to get a publisher, the first case, right? Mm -hmm. So why should they think that uh, I will stop trying to get that message out? You know? Yeah, no, it's, it <laughs> no. says a lot. It says a lot. I think it says that it's the response that they don't want to, for instance, mm -hmm. review a book with a chapter, the New York Times as early apologist for apartheid, right. even though they should. <laughs> like, they frankly, th that's hey. what the news should be about. Right. But it's very funny. Two things, actually. Um, one time when I first contacted them, this is before the book, when I, because the book was birthed for my research paper for my master's paper at Columbia University. And when I sent a copy, I was really, you know, because Columbia Journal Review agreed to print it and then backed off. So I knew they were afraid of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So I sent it to the publisher of the Times at that time, Salzburger. They invited me. I met with Joe Lelyville, the late Joe Lelyville now, and we developed a good relationship. And I was supposed to be like their stringer in East Africa, work with a correspondent. Her name was Donatella Lorch. And then I had dinner with her. We discussed how we would work together and all that. And then she walks me to the train station. And she said, you know, Letterville actually like your paper. I said, oh, good. And then she says, but what do you really want? I said, what do you mean? I mean, I'm going to be working with you as a stringer. 
No, but what do you actually really want? And I was so confused. It was much later than I thought, wait a minute. They thought I wanted something beyond working mm. as a stringer and then working because I actually thought I would be a good correspondent for them eventually and change their coverage. But I think they thought I want something else. So that question kept playing on my mind. Mm -hmm. And then much more recently, the year before the book was published with the publisher, a Times um, reporter, you know, he's domestic here, not international, here in New York, you know, called me because I tweeted about his, when he was sent to Uganda and he wrote some article and I thought it was kind of propaganda, you know. So he gets in touch with me and we go and we have lunch. And I told him how the Ugandan establishment was playing the times on many topics. And then at the end of the day, you know, toward the end, he starts asking me about my book. Oh, so I think I tweeted it. I told my people, be ready. My book is coming out soon. I said, oh, so your book is coming out soon. And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, you know, I think it's much better than the earlier version, blah, blah, blah. I didn't think about it. But then later on, I was thinking, wait, why was he asking me about my book in the first place? And then after that, you know, he broke contact, broke off contact with me after that. So uh, it is what it is. You know, the book is there. I don't think it can be suppressed. And I'll make sure it's not suppressed. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be nice if we could have the major papers of record uh, face up to their history. <laughs> Uh, but uh, until that time, yeah, manufacturing yeah. hate. We'll put a link to the GoFundMe, uh, Milton. And All right. Thank you so much, guys. I really um, appreciate yeah, it. Uh, at Alamadi on Twitter. Um, Milton, thank you so much. Thank you. As always, my pleasure, guys. <laughs>